Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. And of course, well, I'm particularly delighted to welcome Dr. Alexandra de Hoop Schaefer, Director of Research Transatlantic Security and Director of the Paris Office of the Dubber Marshall Fund, who has been very generous uh, in taking time out of her schedule to speak to us today. Uh, just some uh, housekeeping. Uh, Dr. de Hoop Schaefer will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so. And then we will go to question and answers with our audience. Uh, you will be able to join the discussion uh, in the Q&A on Zoom, which you should see uh, on your screen. And please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session uh, as they occur to you. And we will come to them uh, when Dr. De Hoop Schaefer has finished her presentation. I should mention we will have to uh, end the presentation at 10 minutes to two uh, due to uh, Dr. De Hoop Schaefer's schedule. Uh, we will also, during the question and answers, ask you to identify yourself and your affiliation. And a reminder that today's uh, presentation and the question and answers are both on the record. And you can feel free to join the discussion uh, using the handle at IIEA in Twitter. Let me now introduce uh, Dr. Alexandra de Hoop Schaefer uh, just before I hand over. Uh, she is director of the Paris office of the German Marshall Fund of the United States and Director of, Secu of Research for Transatlantic Security. She's also the Managing Director of the Transatlantic Trends Annual Survey. And before joining the um, Marshall Fund, uh, Alexander held several positions in the French government and academia uh, and advised international organizations. She served as Senior Advisor for US Foreign Policy and Transatlantic Relations on the Policy Planning Staff of the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And she has also been an advisor uh, from 2010 to 2013 uh, to NATO's Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. I could go on with many more uh, qualifications and uh, memberships of boards, um, but suffice it to say that um, uh, she, her expertise is regularly sought by major companies and international organizations in anticipating global risk. And she also has a, a degree in war studies from King's College uh, London. Uh, I think we could not have chosen a better time, Alexandra, to invite you uh, to for the title of the discussion today on transatlantic relations post 9-11. Uh, given the events of the past several weeks, uh, it, we are really anxious to hear your assessment of where we go from here. Uh, given the turbulence of Afghanistan, Arcos, et cetera. So with great pleasure, I hand over to you uh, to give us your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and very happy to, to be with you. I remember going to your institute a few years ago uh, around the French uh, presidential elections, and it's always a, a pleasure to be able to, to interact with you and your, uh, and your colleagues. So in fact, yes, the context is really... Um, uh, quite uh, quite particular and uh, gives a lot of uh, of relevance to the discussion we'll be having uh, today. Um, you know, I sit here in in Paris as uh, the director of a transatlantic think tank, um, and I must say that since the end of of August, uh, with the withdrawal from Afghanistan and then the AUKUS alliance, we have been uh, awfully <laughs> awfully busy. Uh, but these are really fascinating times, and I'm also eager to uh, hear your, your perspectives um, on, on what's going on and how the transatlantic relationship is being uh, reshaped um, in many, many respects. Um, I am going to try to be brief uh, so that we can uh, have a, a conversation. Uh, basically, I have three, three main points. Uh, one is... Um, what does America is back mean uh, for uh, allies, uh, for European allies and the transatlantic uh, relationship? What does it mean for us? And what does it mean in terms of our relationship with the new uh, Biden administration? Uh, the second point I want to make um, is obviously that probably we have underestimated um, the scope and depth of um, U.S recalibrating uh, its uh, foreign uh, policy priorities. 
and underestimated the implications that this might have also for us as European allies. Um, so I will dive deeper into you know, this, this recalibration uh, that the United States is uh, undergoing and also linking that to US domestic politics because I think once again, we look at President Biden, we listen to his speeches, but we maybe not pay enough attention to what's going on in US political class and within American society and how these um, deeper trends uh, are also shaping and reshaping uh, US foreign policy priorities and therefore directly impacting uh, Europeans' relationship with Washington. And the last point um, is really linked to a paper that my deputy Martin Conce and myself wrote at the very beginning um, of the Biden uh, administration, which was really to invite um, our American counterparts to maybe be more ambitious in terms of the transatlantic agenda and the transatlantic partnership and, and more generally, which is, it was a proposal to move away from the sort of repetitive, um, sometimes boring uh, burden sharing uh, debate and to move towards a more ambitious transatlantic agenda, which would more be about um, risk sharing and responsibility sharing. And that uh, obviously requires um, both sides of the Atlantic uh, to actually better understand each other, better understand their respect priorities and also to better coordinate their policies um, in areas where uh, they both have co common or different uh, strategic interests. So that's basically the three points I want to make. Um, you know, um, Marie just, just mentioned it. I mean, in recent weeks, uh, the Transatlantic Alliance has endured several uh, serious uh, stress tests. Huh? I think uh, this is a um, a time where uh, the relationship is being tested, not only by external security, geopolitical challenges, uh, but also internally, right? Um, and the mishandling of consultations with uh, the French over the submarine deal with the Australians uh, marks to me um, the third occasion in the last eight months or so um, in which the Biden administration has shaken um, alliance uh, relations. Um, you know, the other two are the lack of operational coordination with allies over the withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan. And before that, um, the frustration and anger uh, in Central Eastern Europe over Washington's willingness to accommodate uh, Germany on the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. Um, and GMF has an office in, in Warsaw. And I can tell you that this was really deeply felt um, in, in countries like, like Poland. Um, the, the, the feeling that uh, uh, Central Eastern European countries have been uh, circumvented uh, and that this was a deal that was decided between Washington and Berlin. And so when you add these different episodes, uh, Nord Stream 2, Afghanistan, and more recently the AUKUS alliance, um, there is an increasing debate in, in Europe across European capitals um, whether this is a pattern or not of US decision making process. Um, a lot of questions and a lot of debates um, at a time, especially where, as you all know, the President Biden arrived and said, you know, my aim after the Trump uh, uh, mandate uh, is actually to recommit to alliances, to multilateralism and cooperation, in particular with uh, European allies. And so, with the AUKUS alliance, adding to the you know two diff two two pr precedent um, episodes, um, there is now a sort of a, you know um, reckoning that we need to have this in depth conversation uh, about uh, the foundations of the transatlantic partnership. Uh, I will get back to that uh, in my in my final uh, in my final remarks. Just to go back to Afghanistan, uh, for me. The Afghanistan crisis revealed uh, several inconvenient truths um, for the transatlantic relationships. For Europeans, it has exposed both our inability 
uh, actually to influence uh, the decision calculus in the United States, uh, but also our powerlessness uh, to defend our own interests, um, right? Evacuate our own citizens and allies, uh, which we were not able to do without uh, the support uh, of Washington. And this should certainly uh, be part of a lessons learned uh, process among Europeans, what, what to do about, about that. For the United States, um, it has demonstrated that even as it calls on Europe to take more responsibility for security and defense, especially in its own uh, neighborhood, uh, most European countries still lack not only the necessary capabilities, but ab above all, the political will uh, to act, right? Uh, and that was very much part of what uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the EU Commission's president, um, emphasized in her uh, speech on the state of the uh, European Union just a few a few days ago. And which leads me to say, I mean, you know, I've been working in the transatlantic field for more than 15 years. And what I see on a recurring basis is how these transatlantic relations have been characterized and still are um, by what I call asymmetric expectations. The United States looks to its European partners, first and foremost, for providing capabilities, the famous burden sharing debate, but also uh, for policy alignment with the US strategic priorities. And European uh, countries look to the United States uh, for a stable, predictable, consultative, inclusive leadership, and of course, security guarantees. And so most of the time, these diverging expectations uh, lead to mutual disappointment. Um, Washington complains that European countries do not do enough, especially in terms of defense spending. And more recently, also uh, complained that European allies are maybe not, so, not that reliable when it comes to dealing with China. And I'll get back to that because, you know, in the AUKUS Alliance context, we've been discussing a lot about this crisis of trust, and I think it is a deep crisis of trust. But this crisis of trust is actually mutual. The United States look at the EU or European partners and say, well, they're too soft on China. We need to be tough. Uh, we need to build stronger alliances with the military uh, component, and Europeans are too soft. And so there's, the, and, and, and uh, you know, the, the fact that um, uh, the EU also signed uh, the investment um, agreement agreement with China uh, just before uh, President Biden uh, was inaugurated was seen also from a Washington perspective as a sort of, um, yeah, EU um, unilateralism, if, if I can say, uh, and the fact that Europeans were not willing to fully align with uh, US policy uh, on, on China. And Europeans, on the other hand, uh, perceive US leadership as less reliable, as permanently unilateral um, and driven by diverging views on geopolitics, trade, and I would more precisely say diverging views of how to respond to these geopolitical, economic, technological challenges, right? Um, I think we more or less share the same diagnosis, but when it comes to responding and, and dealing with these challenges, this is where the conversation uh, becomes slightly more complicated. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it should be an obstacle for um, uh, cooperation uh, between both sides of the Atlantic. So this leads me to say, you know, what does America is back mean? America is back after the, the Trump uh, presidency uh, that you know purposely uh, neglected European allies, uh, multilateral organization. But I think we underestimated the fact that American was back with a very clear agenda, right? Um, China, technological competition in particular, um, and that the EU or European allies would basically be a sort of collateral damage of this very clear US priority. Uh, and we can get back to that in the conversation part. America is back also meant um, 
you know, reinvestment um, by the Biden administration in multilateral alliances, the promise of consulting more with allies. But there again, um, I think we uh, overestimated uh, that uh, Biden agenda. Uh, we are still in a very American trend of selective engagement with allies, uh, with a very clear preference for ad hoc, flexible, um, smaller alliances. Um, and we probably also underestimated the impact of Brexit on how uh, the EU would be perceived as a partner by Washington. Uh, and with the UK out, the EU from a Washington perspective, especially on hard security issues on the Indo-Pacific, um, is, is, is considered as less of a strategic partner uh, than the UK or um, um, Asian allies, you know, that are part now of this quad alliance that Biden just hosted um, in, in Washington. When it comes to NATO, uh, it's, I think it's always the same trend that you see in US policy. Uh, NATO remains relevant uh, for the Biden administration, uh, but as long as it addresses US global interests and priorities. Um, and this is where you see the heavy China item being brought more and more in NATO discussions, technological competition, but also everything that has to do with the hybrid, uh, hybrid threats, right? Um, cyber and, and all of that. So multilateral institutions remain very much relevant for US foreign policy but only as long as it addresses US global interests and, uh, and, and priorities. Uh, and I think that's something we need just to uh, internalize um, in, um, in our strategic uh, thinking uh, as well. Um, now, you know, there is a link between uh, the Afghanistan withdrawal and the AUKUS uh, alliance. I think it's part of a longer uh, term uh, continuum, right? Uh, the Biden administration, very much in the continuum of the Obama administration, then Trump uh, is really the president that is finally operationalizing uh, the so-called pivot uh, to Asia. Um, and that pivot makes uh, strategic sense, right? Uh, uh, it, it, it's part of this broader recalibration uh, that I've been discussing at the, at the beginning. But again, that shift in US priorities has not been easy on European allies, right? Um, and this has created um, a, a crisis of, of, of trust. And the AUKUS alliance, for me, uh, results in big part from a mutual frustration between the US and European partners. Um, from the US perspective, the EU is seen as too soft. And from the EU perspective, uh, the United States is seen as acting too aggressively on China. So there is also part of that a policy, an approach um, disagreement that we actually need to discuss and probably the you know crisis uh, that this AUKUS alliance has provoked in France and uh, uh, across uh, across Europe should be the opportunity to probably uh, have um, an in-depth conversation with the United States on the Indo-Pacific on the role of the EU or European powers uh, in, uh, in the region. And, and I think this conversation has um, already started to, uh, to, to, some, to some extent. Um, and you know, this, this decision of the AUKUS Alliance arrived at the time where actually the EU has been stepping up its policies uh, on China with the screening of Chinese investment in Europe, uh, publishing its uh, strategy. Um, and to a big extent, China has pushed uh, uh, the EU to actually recognize uh, that short-term economic interests could have longer-term strategic implications. And probably the big eye-opener has been the COVID-19 crisis, which revealed to us in a striking way how our dependencies on China on many critical aspects, industrial, pharmaceutical, 
could have deeper political strategic consequences. So this has, I mean, really accelerated what I see as a European awakening um, regarding China. And, and this um, European awakening on, on China uh, should have been seized by the Biden administration uh, to foster um, uh, a more transatlantic dialogue on, on this issue, right? Um, and not consulting uh, France or European allies on the AUKUS alliance was a totally uh, uh, wrong um, approach. Um, and, and, and I think there's a recognition today uh, at the Biden administration level that this was uh, probably not, not, well, uh, not well handled. Um, what this confirms as well uh, is um, US geopolitical uh, priorities. Uh, there has been an acceleration these last, I would say, five years uh, because of China's uh, uh, increasing um, uh, influence and stepping up its military capabilities um, in uh, the South China Sea and more broadly. Um, and so there is, um, you know, a recognition that, for example, the Australian um, decision on the uh, submarines was very much driven by, uh, by China, right, and the fear of, uh, of China uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. And so there is also a discussion uh, to have with our Asian, Asia-Pacific allies in the region of how the EU or European powers can fit um, in uh, the strategies of these Asian partners uh, as well. So basically, I would say, you know, um, there is a clear preference uh, we see today from the part of the Biden administration. Again, it's not something new, it's something recurring uh, in US foreign policy uh, for smaller groupings uh, of, of allies uh, and specifically allies that align with US priorities uh, and, uh, and policies. Uh, um, and and the, the Australian move um, is really a move that uh, translates into an alignment with US policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China, not only from an industrial uh, interoperability uh, perspective, but also from a political, diplomatic, strategic perspective. And to a big extent, uh, you know, France's offer uh, in the Indo-Pacific region was precisely to be um, an interesting partner for Asian allies um, who are a bit concerned of um, aligning too much with the United mm -hmm. States or, um, um, you know, escalating tensions uh, with China and the sort of more balanced approach that France and European partners propose in the region, I, I think still is a relevant and interesting uh, political, industrial, and, uh, and strategic offer that we can make to these partners. So we'll have to see whether the, the I would say, middle term, longer term consequences um, on Europe's uh, partnership policy in the region <laughs> whether this will push um, you know, countries like India or others uh, to become more concerned and say, uh, we need to you know, align more with the United States or whether this will push these countries to, to keep this sort of more balanced um, posture in, uh, in the region. Um, so these trends are going to be interesting to, to follow. Um, lastly, what I wanted to, um, to conclude on and, you know, discuss that in the introduction is, um, you know, when you think of the AUKUS alliance, you think of the Afghanistan withdrawal, um, a sort of reprioritization of U.S. foreign policy uh, objectives. Uh, for me, the big question is, um, in terms of the transatlantic partnership, uh, do we um, still um, uh, operate as, um, you know, uh, burden sharing uh, partners, uh, that is to say a division of labor approach, 
Um, and that is sometimes felt here in Paris um, that you know the US approach in terms of cooperating with Europeans is you know Washington saying we're going to focus on the big one, which is China, the Indo-Pacific, the tech competition, all of that. And, and therefore Europeans should take care more of their neighborhoods uh, southwards and, and eastwards. So a sort of division of, of labor based uh, more or less on geography. Um, I think this is not a satisfying uh, way of working with, uh, with Washington. Um, it's neither satisfying for Americans or uh, Europeans, uh, because in fact, uh, you know, Europeans have also interests in the Indo-Pac and Americans have interests uh, in uh, the South neighborhood of Europe, um, of Europe uh, uh, as well. And for a big reason, which is that Chinese influence uh, is increasing as well uh, in Africa or in the Middle East. And so the so-called big power competition also plays uh, in more regional settings, right? Um, and so these are conversations that we also need to have with uh, our American, um, our American uh, partners. Um, very lastly, and then um, I'm eager to have a conversation uh, with, um, with you. Um, how do we move from you know, burden sharing uh, to risk sharing? Um, and, you know, as I've mentioned at the beginning, I think this is a much more ambitious um, approach to the transatlantic uh, relationship. Uh, for now, um, the U.S. desire for risk sharing is not that clear, um, but we need to move more and more towards that. Um, and hopefully the, you know, the AUKUS uh, alliance um, and, and the discussion, you know, that it has generated between both sides of the Atlantic should be uh, the opportunity to have these deeper conversation no? um, at a time where the US you know, considers China and Chinese assertiveness to be its main geostrategic challenge. There is also a need for Washington uh, to understand that a degree of so-called European strategic autonomy uh, may be necessary for both French and uh, American interests, right? Um, and us Europeans, I think we also need to recognize um, that the United States um, is going through what I will call a deep um, identity crisis both, uh, and abroad, and which actually brought Donald Trump to the White House uh, four years ago. Um, there is a sort of crisis of confidence um, in the United States about its own power and capacity to shape events uh, on the international scene, and that this will lead the United States to be much more selective on the international scene and to have a more narrowly focused uh, type of engagement in international affairs, which you know is basically called U.S. vital uh, interest, right? So in that context, and I'll conclude on that, I think that Biden's um, uh, foreign policy agenda should be compatible with Europe uh, being a credible strategic uh, player, um, having um, a you know, different way of approaching uh, global uh, challenges today. Um, and, and that the EU, you know, non-alignment on US policies or approaches should not be seen as weakness or unreliability from the part of our American uh, uh, colleagues, but as um, uh, something that should, in fact, trigger a constructive uh, conversation and see how uh, the EU or European partners can actually bring added value, uh, complement uh, the US policy in the Indo-Pacific, because it's not just about uh, the military dimension, it's very much about tech, about uh, economic uh, relationships. Uh, and this is probably where the EU also have a lot uh, to, to bring to the conversation. So hopefully, um, the, 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 
you know, anger that this has provoked, especially uh, in Paris and, and rightfully so, uh, it, it will just be the beginning of uh, that type of deeper uh, policy uh, conversations, right? Um, and once we get there, um, probably we will be defining uh, in a more concrete way um, the, the sort of um, risk sharing approach uh, I've been talking about, huh? uh, trying to define more common approaches or coordinated approaches on issues or regions uh, where we have interests um, and where we actually need to be working together instead of competing uh, with one another. So I'll just I'll just end here and uh, very happy to engage with you um, in the conversation. Thank you.